All right, Philip, this is a, a whole lot easier for me and you both. Yeah. How do fossils prove that there was no Adam and Eve? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know where to start with this one. I mean, like, <laughs> uh, fossils prove that that things in the evolutionary standpoint evolved from a specific thing about three to four billion years ago, and that thing continued to evolve over time. Uh, <laughs> there, there, okay, so there was no Adam and Eve because there was no first human. Humans evolved from Australopithecus. If you want to like, break it down to anthropological standpoints. I mean, that's the only answer you can give. Like, so, so what in the gradual evolution of Homo sapiens sapiens? At which point would we pinpoint and say, oh, oh, this couple, that's Adam and Eve. Uh, Neanderthals, does uh, the atonement of Christ cover them? Does it, does it cover Arthritis? But the, the fossil record evolution shows that humanity didn't just poof appear fully formed with our cognitive capabilities and what we are now. We gradually change over time. Our species is still changing. Every species is still changing. Why is the absolute truth of morality necessary? Why must logic be absolute to be useful? Because to say that logic is not absolute means I can cont contradict you from this point forward like I did in my answer with my first question. I could just, just say a bunch of gobbledygook and it wouldn't make any difference. Look, if the laws of logic do not hold in all times, throughout all places, for all people, everywhere, then all types of absurdity and nonsense result. That's why the laws of logic must be absolute. And to say that, to say that the laws of logic cannot be absolute is to make an absolute truth claim. In order to deny the laws of logic being absolute, you have to affirm them in order to deny them. I debated a, uh, an atheist on the British radio three weeks ago, and he had the same problem with me. He said, you know, I can believe that there's a law of non-contradiction, but I can't believe that there's an absolute law of non-contradiction. They are not the same. You know what I said to him? Oh, so you believe they're the same. <laughs> He said, no, they're not the same. I said, oh, so you believe they're the same. He says, no. I contradicted him, and he had a problem with that because he believes in the absolute law of non contradiction. Now, if you want to hear that debate, if you want to hear that debate, you can go to my website and navigate to the multi page, and there's a link to it. But in order to get to that page, you have to get all the questions right, and I think only half the room might do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Would you agree that most people believe in the Christian God because they are scared to accept that some things are irrational and therefore push all rationality towards something that can beg no questions? In, in my opinion, I think most people who believe in Christianity believe because of the accident of geography. Uh, if you're born in Brazil, most likely you're going to be Catholic. If you're born in Saudi Arabia, most, almost 99.9%, you're going to be a Muslim. If you're born in the South, in the United States, it's not, a, it's not a law, but overwhelmingly, most likely, you're going to be a Christian. When I had this deeply emotional experience, I didn't see a cross. There wasn't a burning bush. There wasn't anything tangible that said, this experience is Christian. No, I, I translated my experience that I have, which was deeply emotional and important to me. I translated it according to the culture and religious tradition that I was familiar with. That's what most people do. So I believe most people are Christians because of the accident of geography, where they're born. And to me, that poses a problem for God. So how do you explain the explosion of Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> demonstrate the values of the Bible that, that we should believe in the superiority of faith over, over reason. Yes. Romans chapter 1 without says... Without the Bible. I'm sorry. Without the Bible. You demonstrate without using biblical passages. Yes. And, yes, exactly. Thank you. Romans <laughs> chapter... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Romans chapter 1 says chapter 1 tells us that apart from the Bible, apart from special revelation found in the Bible, all men know God exists. This is exactly what you see throughout all human people throughout the world. People worship something. They worship totem poles and rocks and Allah and some of them worship anything you can imagine. Creatures, multiple gods, they make gods in their own image. People are created to worship. 
Tigers don't worship. Chimps don't worship. Why do people worship? They worship because they're created to do that. You have natural revelation. People are going to have a basic innate knowledge of God that's hardwired within them. God tells us that He's done that. But people don't need to have the Bible to know that that's true. All you have to do is look at the history of mankind and you will see that we are a worshiping species. authority for knowing anything at all? Yourself? What is your ultimate authority for knowing anything at all? Yourself? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, as the argument that I pointed out earlier that Kierkegaard stated from the original Kogita Ergo Sum, X thinks, I am that X, I think, therefore I am. There, There is nothing beyond that. We've asked them for a proof, that, we've asked the other side for a proof that their God exists over other gods, but they have not given one. Why is their God valid over the God of Allah, uh, Ganesh? You can name a, a thousand gods, and they can't give a proof that the Christian God is valid. We've asked it several times tonight, and no proof has been given, because you can't give a proof. But there are proofs that we can say that our ability to reason, our ability to think, is not absolute, because we don't believe in absolute reason. However, we believe that there is a reason that humans can attest to. We use reason, right? We're basing our arguments on reason, on evidence. And I don't want to belittle them because I believe that they also base their experiences on reason and evidence. So if someone today claims uh, that God commanded them to kill their son, they would demand evidence for that. If someone today claimed that their long hair gave them superhuman power, they would probably demand evidence for that. I'm assuming, I'm hoping. So we all use reason. They're adding one extra step there to say that the Bible is their authority to guide and suppress their reason. And all I'm asking again and again is to give me good reason why I should believe that the Bible is a reliable guide. That's all I'm asking. I've said it again and again. I've also talked about the problem of suffering. And I know they have an answer to this. And I would like them to share it if, if they want at some point. But the problem of suffering. That, to me, presents a problem of contradiction in the, the, the nature of God, as Christians understand it. Where do dinosaurs exist in the Bible? Job chapter 40 talks about behemoth. It says that he has uh, legs that are like uh, those that are made like bars of iron. He has a tail like a cedar tree. The Bible tells us that God made everything in the space of six days, approximately 6,000 years ago. You cannot fit millions of years into Scripture. If you're here tonight and you're a Christian, it does not work. The Bible mentions that there are dinosaur-like creatures that are in Job, chapter 40 and 41. The Bible tells us of the Tanaim in Genesis chapter 1. That's a Hebrew word translated as great sea monsters. It tells us on day 6 that He made the great land-dwelling animals along with man. That means that humans and dinos existed together. That's the logical. Okay, we need to. We've got several more questions. Please, uh, go will help us move forward. If we, along with Kierkegaard, arbitrarily assert our own existence, how does that help us logically? Is not that akin to simply asserting an opinion? and hoping that no one notices. Uh, Kierkegaard states that the same thing that I uh, had earlier removes yourself from logic. If you're going to use logical presuppositions, 
like our, our opponents are doing tonight, they they are not actually providing an they they providing no assertion that their worldview is correct. They're just saying you have to believe in God. There is no example. There is no reason to believe in God. They're just saying you have to believe in God for our logic to work. 